This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Let me just leave you with uh, a few key messages, and I'm going to start with them so that hopefully you can track what I'm saying as we go through the details. Um, you know, the first is that the science is basically settled, that global warming is a very real and serious threat, and the kinds of uncertainties that remain actually should make us more nervous. Uh, they shouldn't be any reason for delay, they should be a reason for moving faster to try to exercise the precautionary principle and really reduce the global risk that we're running right now that we don't fully understand in a way that should make us nervous. Um, the second point is that the world has started to deal with this problem, and in particular the European Union has taken some very serious steps, and now the politics are starting to move in the right direction here, and that's the way we're trying to ride all the way through to the goal line and get uh, serious legislation in place um, over the next year, hopefully, um, under the leadership of the new president and the new Congress. Third point is that NRDC is involved in trying to make sure that we get the details right, because this is immensely complicated, as you will soon see. And so we're trying to make sure that the type of law that we put in place and the, the associated regulations that come out of that work for solutions providers. That it's the kind of playing field that allows those that want to deliver clean energy and those that want to deliver energy efficiency and everything else that we need to operate quickly, to scale rapidly. Uh, and then we also have to attend to some other issues. We have to make sure that we protect consumers from the uh, energy price impacts that come under the legislation, and we have to deal with the warming world itself through adaptation investments. Uh, second to last point, we'll just briefly touch on the fact that businesses need to pay attention to all this and need to get out in front of the trends, and those that do can profit. Uh, and lastly, if there's time, I may give a little bit of a global perspective on what can happen next with China. Uh, so briefly on the science. The basic point here is that everyone from the corporate sector to the scientists themselves and now even the politicians recognize that this is a real threat. Indeed, uh, the polar ice cap is melting and there really isn't any ambiguity about what is going on at this point. Again, there's uncertainty, but that uncertainty isn't exactly comforting because it cuts both ways. Uh, just a quick picture of some of the, uh, here's a, a perfect illustration of one of the ways in which you can end up on the wrong side of the bell curve with respect to risk. Uh, it turns out that the ice cap is melting faster than the models would project, not by a lot, but by somewhat. And it's just an illustration of the fact that you, you can get uh, caught uh, on the wrong side of those odds in some cases. And in general, we, we, we've seen uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming very clearly since the Industrial Revolution started. We've seen sea level starting to increase, snow cover diminishing. And let's not forget acidification of the oceans because this is, as I'm sure you're all very well aware uh, in this setting, uh, a critical issue as well. And, and if you by the way, go with some of the geoengineering solutions, uh, quote unquote solutions to global warming, you don't attend to the fact that CO2 in the atmosphere ends up in the oceans, acidifies the oceans and kills the coral. Um, so shortcuts don't necessarily get us out of this problem completely. Um, again, briefly, uh, in the interest of time, this is the classic uh, correlation between temperature and CO2 over hundreds of thousands of years. The main point, uh, without overstating the case, is that there is a strong historical correlation. The, the oscillations you see here are mainly driven by orbital cycles, the Milankovitch cycles. Um, there's a, a classic question about, well, wait a minute, doesn't the CO2 uh, actually lag the temperature? And the answer is yes. But we understand that what's going on there is that there's a, um, the, the orbital cycle causes uh, an initial warming, and then that actually creates a self-reinforcing uh, process involving changes in the reflectivity when the ice caps start to melt, uh, and then deep ocean cycles and so on. And, and in any event, over, over period, you do see that there is a clear self-reinforcing 
uh, connection between CO2 and temperature. The details are complicated, uh, but there is clearly that correlation present. Uh, and then the main point here is that we are already jumped way above anywhere we've been in, in hundreds of thousands of years in terms of CO2 concentration, up at 385 versus 290 uh, uh, previously, uh, at least in human history and, and before. And, and then uh, we're going to be going towards completely unchar uncharted terrain. Uh, now, I don't mean to su suggest that we're going to get 20 degrees centigrade warming, but the point is that we are running one heck of an experiment. So by the end of this century, uh, if we don't change course, we're looking at something like a quadrupling or certainly a tripling of CO2 levels, and that is uh, quite a roll of the dice. Um, and so let's talk about what that might entail. This is basically uh, what the models say. And, and there's a pretty good connection between uh, sort of the back cast of uh, industrial revolution CO2 levels and the, what the models would predict the temperature uh, would be. And going forward, there's a range, of course, because it's modeling and it's necessarily uncertain. But all of it involves substantial warming because there's no ambiguity about the fact that we're changing the whole atmosphere. Uh, and there's no ambiguity about the fact that to a first approximation, more CO2 in the atmosphere means more warming. Now, there's lots of feedbacks, lots of complexities. We touched on a couple of them in the prior slide. Uh, but in any event, a big experiment. And by the end of the century, uh, you may end up in a, in a world that looks radically different, especially in some regions, especially towards the poles. So what are we doing about it? Well, you know, the good news is, is here, I guess, in some ways. Uh, let me talk about this briefly. This is a picture of what the European Union started to do in 2005 with their cap on emissions and their associated trading system. So the basic notion is that uh, just, as the, uh, just as the US pioneered for reducing uh, sulfur pollution and acid rain um, with, with great success, the European Union's put a cap on their emissions and then they allowed companies uh, to trade their pollution rights. And that started in 2005. Uh, and, and, a, and a quick look at this graph would suggest that something went wrong. And, it, and in fact, it did. Uh, here you can see that the price in the, uh, in the first phase of trading in 2005 to 2007 crashed to zero, which uh, is not a well-functioning market. What happened is that they didn't have their numbers straight. They didn't uh, uh, really sort out the details and get the measurements in place to know exactly what the pollution levels were. Uh, to their credit, they moved very quickly to put this in place, and that had a lot of political benefits uh, and motivated a lot of important policies, but they didn't have the numbers right. That's been solved, and now you see a much more stable uh, pollution price in the second phase of trading uh, in this carbon market in Europe. Um, and, uh, and currently, it's tapered down a bit with the recession, but we're in the Euro 10 to 15 uh, range on these uh, pollution rights. There are a couple of other uh, concerns with the way that the European Union addressed this, and it's worth touching on both of them. The, the, the second would be uh, that, in general, in the early days especially, the European Union gave away all these pollution rights. So you can think about this as analogous to broadcast spectrum. And when the US has uh, a new set of bandwidth that they want to uh, provide to industry, you don't give it away. You sell it. And the reason is that it's a public good. It's something that the public should benefit from. And there's no particular reason to just give it away to one company versus another. Uh, unfortunately, when the European Union kicked this whole market off, uh, they actually gave away or grandfathered um, essentially all the allowances to industry, and that resulted in windfall profits uh, because basically the way that it worked is that power companies were given the pollution rights that they needed, and then they had, an, they had this thing that they could now trade. And so the market price on electricity went up to reflect the value of that asset that they now had to turn in at the end of every year uh, based on their pollution. And so they, they profited uh, from that. So the, the, the price of power went up to reflect the cost of pollution, but they'd been given the pollution rights that they needed to comply. Uh, so it ended up being a double benefit, a major windfall, and it cost taxpayers dearly. Uh, and it was an unnecessary mistake, which I don't believe we will repeat in the, in the US context. I think we've gotten that very clear. Uh, President Obama has been very clear uh, on the need to uh, make sure that the pollution rights are used and the value attached to them are used for public purposes, just as we do with something like broadcast spectrum. Um, the third issue, which I'll only touch on very briefly, is 
around um, how they've actually achieved the emissions reductions in, in the European Union. So the basic notion is that you put a cap on pollution and you ratchet it down over time and you try to drive uh, uh, carbon emissions out of the economy. Um, what the European Union did is to allow, in addition to domestic emissions reductions, they allowed uh, uh, polluters, power companies, industrial uh, facilities, et cetera, to purchase um, emissions reductions uh, credits from abroad, from developing countries, in something called the Clean Development Mechanism. And that, as it turns out, has been a large share of the uh, emissions reductions that the European Union has done. And uh, I would argue, at least, that they've over-relied on that approach. So that's another important dimension to how this has played out in the EU. All of that said, the mechanics have worked just fine. And it has put a price on pollution. It has solved a substantial uh, omission in the markets. It has, it has solved a market failure, or at least started to solve it. And it has prompted a whole range of important uh, additional actions to improve energy efficiency and fuel economy and vehicles and so on. Um, and it's proven the concept of cap and trade for this market uh, quite well, I think, once they got the, the wrinkles uh, ironed out. Turning to the U.S. context, so this is a very, very complicated chart, but basically the essence of it is to say that uh, states and localities have been leading on global warming, most of all California, as you all well know, uh, in the absence of federal leadership. And so this is from April 2008. Uh, a few years prior, this would have been largely blank, but there's all sorts of mandatory caps. Uh, the AB32 law, of course, famously in, in California. Uh, Northeast has the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, et cetera. And it, is a, it has been an, an incredible amount of activity and success uh, in, in trying to replace the leadership that was absent in recent years in DC. Um, that, by the way, makes companies nervous and uneasy because it's very hard to deal with a patchwork of regulations of this sort. And so it has helped to create momentum for federal action to deal with this issue in a more comprehensive way, in a more clear way, in a way that allows uh, solutions providers to operate, operate nationwide in dealing with this. And most importantly, uh, or at least one important example of that, is the US Climate Action Partnership, which involved uh, I guess now 25 major Fortune 500 companies, a number of NGOs, including NRDC. And the basic point of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, or U.S. CAP, is a call to put a similar regulation in place in the U.S. to what the European Union has done and to drive down emissions over a multi-decade period in a way that's clear and that, again, allows business to operate and to clean up their act in a, in a very uh, structured way uh, and with, with certainty for investors. That corporate pressure and that fairly uh, clear signal from the private sector has helped to create momentum on the Hill uh, in Washington, and people are moving uh, to actually get laws in place now that will definitively address this. And then, of course, uh, the Obama administration has underscored the need to move um, seriously on this. But it's not going to be easy. Uh, and if you look at the political map, um, there. Uh, are major challenges in terms of getting the final vote count that's needed uh, in order to pass legislation to deal with this issue. This is a multi-trillion dollar question when you look at the dollars involved over a, a period of decades. Uh, there are many zero-sum aspects to it. There are many regional implications in terms of equity. Uh, and there's massive implications for all businesses uh, that have energy consumption of any significance and many others as well. And so, it's politically challenging. Uh, and we are working to address the concerns of key senators, as are others, and trying to uh, move this forward in a way that uh, meets the needs of, uh, of the whole nation. So let me give a little bit more in-depth explanation of how this whole cap and trade concept works. Uh, and, and then we'll go into some more of the details that we're trying to sort out. Uh, First, on the right-hand side of the page, uh, this is, again, the notion that you put a cap on emissions and it declines over time. And then every polluter has to have enough pollution rights at the end of the year to turn into the government, uh, it's like a voucher, um, equal to their tons of CO2 emitted during the year. And then it gets shredded up and you start all over again the following year. Uh, if you then, as a polluter, uh, are able to cut your emissions, then you will have some extra pollution rights or pollution allowances that you can sell. 
and then there's trading that happens. Um, so what it means is that you end up with a price on pollution that looks, that looks much like a carbon tax in terms of the signal it gives to the market. Uh, and it also means that those who are best able to reduce emissions uh, have a clear incentive to do so to the extent that they can. And those that maybe have some kind of structural reason why they can't cut their emissions, perhaps they just recently built uh, a facility and they don't want to scrap it, um, or for whatever reason, geographically, they may have some constraints, can buy extra pollution allowances uh, from those that are better positioned, and you end up with a more efficient outcome. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would highlight here, really, is that um, small energy consumers don't trade these allowances directly. You don't have everyone, uh, as they go to fill up their Prius, uh, somehow turning in their pollution allowance uh, to, go with the, to go with the gasoline consumption. That all happens way upstream. It happens at the refinery. Uh, and it's really a small number of um, major factories, power companies, refineries that are involved in the trading. And that's what keeps it manageable, manageable from an administrative perspective. Um, and then I would just mention that when you, when you multiply the number of pollution rights, the number of allowances that are um, provided in any given year times the market price that emerges for those allowances, you get the total revenue or the total value that the government can get from selling those allowances or otherwise distributing them. And that's a big number. It turns out there's about 6 billion tons a year likely to fall under the cap initially, 6 billion tons of CO2 pollution or uh, pollution allowance rights. Uh, and they're likely to trade probably in the range of $20 each. And so six times 20, $120 billion initially, that number is going to probably trend upwards as the price on pollution goes up. Uh, and so you're going to see major revenue coming out of this. Last year, we had sort of a test run on trying to deal with this uh, legislative challenge. And it was uh, most notably from Senators Lieberman and Warner. Uh, there was a bill introduced uh, for a cap-and-trade system. Um, we were supportive, uh, the whole environmental community was supportive, um, and we fell short. I throw this up to indicate one of the reasons we think we fell short, and to draw a contrast with what we're proposing going forward in a moment. Um, this is how the Lieberman Warner Bill uh, divided up the allowance value. So that, again, there's the nearly six billion tons a year initially, uh, by 2050, it tapers way down as you decline the cap. And this is the, frankly, laundry list of things to which these pollution allowances or the associated dollars were going to be allocated. And it was too complicated. And it was not the right mix. I don't think that we uh, nailed it as a community um, as well as we needed to. So I throw that up there just as an illustration. A lot of great learning happened through this process. And of course, the senators are to be commended for what they did, and, and we did uh, collectively move forward, but it was in some sense a dry run uh, for uh, this year's legislative season in which we hope to actually get the law passed. Uh, and that brings us to the um, CAP 2.0 concept, which is uh, just a, a way to, to reference the fact that this is an attempt to do next generation climate legislation that gets all the details right. And uh, I throw up here just a, a quick explanation that our goal in, in NRDC's CAP 2.0 effort has been uh, to try to reduce the, to really minimize the long-term cost of solving this problem uh, by uh, designing smart legislation. Uh, we have a set of uh, steering committee members from industry and academia, and we try to cover the key topics. Um, and let me now move into the, the heart of the matter in the, in the short remaining time. This is a picture that, in a sense, ends up being our work plan as we think about how to design climate legislation that will succeed. Um, and this comes out of work that uh, I was involved with when I was at McKinsey. Um, and it's basically an effort to, in one place and in one internally consistent way, talk about what are the things that we need to do in order to cut global warming pollution um, as much as we need to. In this case, 80% by the year 2050. And it turns out you can, there's much more detail underlying this, but you can pretty much group things into eight big categories. Uh, and, and then you can array them across these two axes. What you have here then, for example, with buildings efficiency, there's a net savings involved with buildings efficiency investments, right? If you put in place a compact fluorescent lamp, it might cost you an extra couple of dollars, but it'll save you $40. So with any reasonable discount rate, that's a good deal. 
Um, the question, of course, is how do you get people to do it? Still today, uh, something like half the light bulbs sold are regular old Edison incandescents. Um, and so it's tough to make it happen. But in principle, uh, there's a savings to be realized there. Same thing with fuel economy in vehicles. When you find a way to force manufacturers to provide uh, more fuel efficient vehicles, it's a great deal for consumers. A little bit more expensive vehicle up front, much more savings down the line in terms of avoided fuel costs. Uh, and so you can march along this curve and see what it takes in terms of uh, a whole set of specific measures underlying each of these buckets until you get into um, a big chunk of, of emissions reduction uh, that comes at, a, at an unavoidable cost for carbon capture and storage, for example. Um, this is the concept of putting a gizmo on a power plant which captures the CO2 and puts it into geologic sequestration, keeps it out of the atmosphere. There's no way to do that without spending significant additional money because you have to put the machinery in place and then you have to operate it. And it turns out it uses an extra 20% more coal in order to operate the thing. That is probably an essential part of a global solution to this problem. It's not clear how you deal with China, for example, without dealing with coal very squarely. Uh, and it's probably going to cost some money. But the good news is that there, there's very uh, detailed analysis underlying this and what it suggests, and now McKinsey has done this over and over again uh, in different geographies and in different ways, but they keep coming to a similar answer, which is that overall, the savings from the energy efficiency potential, if you make it happen, is roughly of a similar order of magnitude to the cost of what we need to do to clean up our remaining energy supply needs after we have a more energy efficient economy. So if you can get that prize on the left hand side, this can be kind of a break even cost. So anyhow, we think that there's three things that need to go into good climate legislation. The first is the, the core carbon market itself. So making sure that there's no uh, market manipulation with the trading of CO2 allowances and making sure that you're dealing with the whole range of, um, of core regulations well. The second piece is how do you unlock that energy efficiency? And, and that's where you get into things like fuel economy standards for vehicles, building codes, making sure that states are motivated to have uh, aggressive leadership on energy efficiency, just like California has demonstrated. We need all 50 states to be at least as good as California on energy efficiency, and that's a tall order. Um, but we think there's ways to make that happen. Uh, and then lastly, on the right-hand side of the curve, over time especially, you want to make sure that you're bringing new technologies into the picture and that you're bringing down the cost of existing technologies through innovation. And that's uh, fully funding energy R&D and it's making sure that you have support for early stage commercialization of things like renewables. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about each of these and then get into some questions at the end. Um, back to we hope a simpler version of what to do with the allowance revenue, although admittedly not as simple as we'd like it to be. Uh, this is NRDC's proposal as to what um, climate legislation should do across three major competing priorities, right? Uh, and, and let me just walk through those in, in, in a little bit of depth. Um, you know, again, on the y-axis here, you have how many billions of dollars a year does the government have to play with based on, you know, again, those six billion tons under the cap, maybe 20 or $30 a ton for the uh, pollution rights. Multiply those two together, that's the value that, they, that you can distribute to different people to try to get things done and make this, uh, make this happen uh, in terms of emissions reductions. And to deal with adaptation concerns and to deal with um, consumer concerns. So those are the three buckets. And, and what you see in the red is the amount of money that NRDC believes can go straight back to consumers in the form of tax reductions of one sort or another or rebate checks. So you pay a price on your uh, utility bill or at the pump uh, for the pollution that's now correctly priced into the energy you're consuming, but it comes back to you in a reduction in some kind of a, um, a tax that you otherwise would be paying. Um, and so that's, that's what the red represents. And in our view, after 15 years of, of this program, you should default to doing pretty much 100% cap and dividend, as that is called. So most of the money uh, goes straight back. Most of the money raised from the sale of pollution allowances goes straight back to consumers. Um, moving into the yellow, in the first 15 years of the program, and with a little bit of a ramp up there prior to when it would launch properly in 2012, um, we do think that it's very important to 
have that investment in energy efficiency and that investment in clean energy innovation uh, that I just referenced before. And, and it's crucial that that be put in place as the way to jumpstart this whole process. And then lastly, we need to start to ramp up um, especially international uh, investment and adaptation. And that's, that green sliver there is probably going to need to grow uh, quite a bit, especially after um, what's shown here. Congress will need to, as part of international negotiations and as part of making sure that places like Bangladesh and Sub-Saharan Africa can get through this, contribute our share to um, addressing the very real impending impacts of climate change in, in developing countries. Um, lots more details here, which we can come back to if there's interest, but that's sort of the big picture as we see it in terms of dividing up um, the, the pie of, of dollars. And then this is a much more detailed version of what underlies that, uh, and I don't want to get into this in too much depth here except to say that uh, you know, within adaptation, for example, it splits between domestic and international. Um, within the whole question of um, direct investment, it mainly splits between um, research, but then also some deployment by category of technology. And we do think that there's a need to think about broad, a portfolio of broad categories of technologies that need early stage kickstart support to get into the marketplace. Uh, and then the, the way that you give money back to consumers, um, there's immense detail that needs to be attended to there and is unavoidable. So let me just talk uh, about some of the details here, uh, illustratively. Uh, the first point is, well, how can we do this now? We're in the midst of the Great Recession, as some have been calling it. It's um, a challenging time to get anything done in Washington because things are so busy and because it really is an economic crisis. Well, we believe that, and I think there's quite a few who, who echo this in one form or another, that the recession is actually a cause for moving faster to define climate legislation. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but here's the logic. If you pass a law right now, uh, or by, within the year, what that means is that immediately, as soon as the law passes, investors know where you're headed. Now there's clarity about, okay, in the long run, what does our energy economy need to look like? And then you can start to uh, actually unlock capital investment in major infrastructure accordingly. And so that investor certainty will help to move money off the sidelines and get people back to work again in its own right. Hard to quantify, but it's an important issue. The second point is that with this comes all the revenue that we just talked about. And that then gives the government a basis for bolstering the fiscal stimulus that's already underway. And by the way, paying back some of the fiscal stimulus that we're already committed to um, in the next few years before the actual cap and trade gets launched. Because if you pass the law right now, you won't launch the cap and trade market. You won't actually impose the caps until 2012. So there's a few years there, which conveniently enough, uh, we think we may still be kind of fully rebuilding out of this recession since it seems to be such a sustained and serious one. Uh, and, and you don't have any energy price impacts to worry about until 2012, until you actually put the cap in place and, and launch things. Uh, but so in the interim, you can do more to deploy efficiency and to ramp up clean energy investment, and then you have a way to pay for it down the line once you launch the market and start to sell these uh, pollution allowances. Uh, and we also think that there's some ways that the private sector can invest off of this directly as well. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will move through these very quickly, but come back to whatever people want to talk about in the Q&A. This is some work um, that Professor Agner has been kind enough to provide some critical review on, which has been very helpful. It's still work in progress. I just want to give you a quick sense of the concept here. This is basically uh, a quick sketch of one metric that you could use with some minor weather adjustments to track per capita energy consumption in California and compare that with North Dakota. And it's a remarkably different picture. California, as you all well know, is uh, extremely aggressive about its energy efficiency investments and very successful. And what we think is that some of those federal dollars that come out of climate legislation can be used to encourage North Dakota to turn things around completely and start to look more like California. You can fund some of their efficiency efforts in North Dakota with federal climate dollars, and then you can make sure that those states that demonstrate success in turning things around and tracking more like California end up with more funding over time. Uh, so that's one of the big ideas we have, because you can't control energy efficiency at the federal level, but you can incentivize it and you can help to pay for it. Energy efficiency has to be done and driven at the state level, but we've got to find a way to get North Dakota moving 
and a bunch of other states that aren't doing enough yet. Uh, and this is one incentive structure we think could make it happen. Briefly, uh, on appliances, it turns out that there's, um, this is just an illustration for TVs, that there's a wide range within a certain fixed uh, vertical there in terms of the size of the TV. There's a very wide range in terms of how energy intensive they are. So why not then have an incentive for the most efficient uh, appliances to move faster into the marketplace? In fact, this concept got built into the Lehman-Warner bill, um, and now it's also in the uh, Waxman-Markey bill. Uh, and so that's another idea for trying to move energy efficiency at the national level uh, more, more quickly through the, through the appliances market. Uh, similar concept with buildings. When you look at the energy intensity in BTUs per square foot of the building stock, even when you try to look at a particular corner of the building stock and correct for whatever you can, you see there's a massive, uh, something like factor of seven range of energy intensity. Uh, and that's just because old buildings weren't built as well and some of them haven't been maintained as well and so on. So if you can find a way to address uh, the uh, terribly energy intensive buildings on the right hand side of this curve, there's a lot of bang for the buck there. And we think that there's uh, a similar role for a federal program to encourage aggressive building retrofits within the context of climate legislation. And that can be done federally. Talking here now on the right-hand side of the cost curve that I showed you and the whole question of energy innovation and, and uh, making sure that we have a way to reduce the cost of some of the more expensive technologies over time. This is what we're uh, proposing in terms of um, how to support renewables. And, and the idea here is that, um, let me do a compare and contrast. The Liebman Warner bill that I referenced basically, in my view at least, was the reverse of what needs to happen. It, it would have provided an ongoing subsidy to whatever renewable technology was able to uh, compete at the lowest price point. So first there'd be a, a, level, a more level playing field because you've got a price on pollution, right? So you've, you've fixed the fundamental pollution problem. And then the bill was gonna give subsidies to the most mature, lowest cost renewable indefinitely. And that would have amounted to a windfall without any real bang for your buck. So what we suggest is that you flip that around and you say, okay, for emerging renewables, for things like uh, concentrating solar power or for solar photovoltaics or even for uh, certain geothermal, et cetera, uh, there is a period of time in which some, some kickstart support can help to launch whole new classes of technologies or whole new categories of technologies into the market. And in fact, across the board, we've seen that there has been a government role for supporting new energy technologies historically. Um, it'd be nice if we could do it without any subsidies. It doesn't really work because um, a classic example would be carbon capture and storage. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's contemplating building a carbon capture and storage facility today. You have to invest in figuring out how to cobble together a set of technologies, which are all out there more or less, but then you gotta scale them by more than an order of magnitude relative to what they've ever uh, uh, assembled before. You've gotta figure out who's gonna regulate you, and then you've gotta figure out what kind of insurance is gonna be used in order to make it all hang together financially. And then you've gotta get the public comfortable with the notion that you're gonna put the CO2 underground somewhere. You gotta make sure that the science is all sorted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what, once you've done that, and if you build the thing and you turn it on, most of what you just figured out, most of that learning by doing is now available to your competitors. So why bother, just wait. And that's typically the answer in the energy sector is that nobody really wants to get too far out in front of technology development and, and early stage deployment because it's sort of a sucker's game. Um, lots of systems uh, integration, learning by doing that has to happen, and a lot of that spills over to competitors. And so unless you have an early stage deployment support system, and, and the notion here is that the support gradually, you start with things like loan guarantees and investment incentives, and then you go into a production incentive that looks like the current support for wind, and then it phases out completely once you have a 5% market share. Then it's gone, and then you just have the, the, the carbon price and on you go, hopefully. Uh, this, we think, is the kind of mechanism which, for a price tag on the order of $100 billion over 15 years, a lot of money, but not, not uh, that big relative to the scale of the challenge, could get us something like a 40 or 50% renewable share uh, by 2030. And, and that's not gonna happen unless you have this kind of support in place, unless it's clear and it's something that allows the industry to scale efficiently and smoothly in response to that kind of playing field. Uh, briefly, back to the US cap. Uh, effort, I just wanted to mention there's, there's a set of things here that um, we've been able to help 
motivate in the US CAP process. And, uh, and if, you, if you read some of the documentation coming out of that, you'll see that uh, the US CAP group has been very supportive of the notion that you need these complementary policies to encourage energy efficiency. You need to deal with innovation. Uh, and there's a lot of nuances about how you uh, design the legislation. Um, as promised, I want to touch on what this all means for companies. And I promise I'll uh, be quiet here and take questions momentarily. Um, basically, this is just a conceptual sketch of what are the key drivers for any company in thinking about uh, climate change. And, and there are really two that I would highlight. Uh, the first and most obvious is, OK, there's going to be a new energy price landscape. Once you put in, in place a price on pollution, uh, coal is going to be much more expensive. Uh, oil is going to be somewhat more expensive, and natural gas is going to be a little bit more expensive. And that's very important, especially if you're an energy intensive uh, industrial or an airline, someone like that. Uh, that's going to have major direct price implications for you on the x axis. Now, in addition to that, there's all these dollars that we've been talking about, and the renewables deployment incentives, and the energy efficiency incentives, and so on. And those are also going to matter tremendously to industry. And so, uh, if you're a pharma company, as, as one extreme, you don't use that much energy typically as part of your overall uh, cost structure, and you're not likely to qualify for any major incentives for renewables or otherwise. You might tap into this or that, but it's not going to be a major strategic driver um, to think about climate legislation as a pharma company. Contrast that with uh, a coal-fired utility. Uh, there, this is everything, right? Because uh, they are squarely in the bullseye in terms of the cost implications, the price implications, uh, and how they tap into things like uh, deployment support for renewables or other clean supply uh, is going to be critical to how they transition and position to profit in this new landscape. Now, let me say that um, my former employer, McKinsey, has done some recent surveys of global executives. And it's uh, encouraging to note that not only do uh, almost all uh, executives worldwide think that broader climate legislation and, and climate policy is coming uh, quickly, but 60% of them believe that their company can, on balance, profit from the transition. And, and that's true, because all it takes is, um, with a few exceptions, all it takes is some foresight and understanding that getting out in front of things uh, can, can put you in a better place. And then briefly, just on the international front, uh, I think it's important to just touch on this. Not, we don't have time to talk about it in depth. But there's a tendency to look at all this and say, well, wait a minute, China is already surpassing the US in terms of its annual emissions. Uh, OK, we're four times as much per capita, but we, we're not going to solve this without them. Uh, and that's true. And, and you can also say, well, there's um, tropical deforestation. So there's another similar chunk of the problem. Um, and we need to somehow address that as well. And so it's a global issue. You need a global regime in order to handle it. And so uh, it's easy to, at some points, get um, disheartened. But I think you can flip that around. And, and it's important to remember that there's actually relatively few big blocks of players that need to be brought to the table here. And the EU and the other Kyoto implementing countries are already there. And they're already doing uh, a substantial amount. Maybe not enough, and maybe not exactly the right way, but they're already moving. Uh, and the US, I believe, will move this year, uh, or certainly within the next 12 months in, in a major way. I'm at least hopeful about that. Uh, and once that happens, the next step is really that you need to bring China into the tent and then those tropical deforesting countries. And then the rest can come a little bit more slowly. And, and you will have addressed. Um, it, it, just with China, you're addressing what, what we have here. I guess it's roughly two thirds of, of fossil CO2 emissions with EU, US, and China. Uh, and, and then, of course, you want to try to bring India into some sort of a system, et cetera. But it's, it's not quite as daunting when you start to think of it in those terms. Uh, and then, in terms of tropical deforestation, even that breaks down to a relatively few major countries being the essence. Uh, it's really a Brazil, an Indonesia, a Congo. It's not, um, it's not dozens. So just a note of, uh, of hope there. And, and up until now, there's been a universal and unassailable excuse uh, for inaction on the part of those not yet dealing with this problem internationally. And that's, wait a minute, the United States is by far the biggest per capita emitter, and you're not doing anything, really. 
Um, so why would India, with 1 20th the per capita emissions of the US, even talk about addressing this problem? But that psychology is changing already. I think that you see that in international discussions already. People understand that uh, the US is going to move, and that's going to, I believe, open up faster progress opportunities than people have, have been thinking. Uh, so just leave you with the key messages and open it up for discussion. There's a number of voices out there um, suggesting that this whole cap and trade business is too complex and we ought to simply tax the polluters directly. That's one question. The other question is, why not use the regulatory authority of the EPA under the Clean Air Act to do some of this? Both great questions. Uh, let me start and, and focus primarily on the whole question of um, caps versus taxes. And our view is that there's actually more in common than different between uh, caps and taxes. And that's a very important and subtle point. Um, there's a tendency to compare a fully fleshed out and unfortunately inevitably complex uh, cap and trade legislative proposal against a stylized notion of a carbon tax. Ah, carbon tax, and it's put in place and we're done. Um, but guess what? You need to do all the same emissions tracking uh, to do a carbon tax. Um, you need to figure out what to do if the carbon tax ends up being too low to get the job done. And that introduces all kinds of deep uncertainties, including regulatory uncertainty then. Um, and many companies, I think, would prefer to have the government lay out a clear trajectory over a long period of time, allow banking and borrowing and a cap and trade over, over a period of many years, and then allow the market to sort of reveal the price, as opposed to having a carbon tax schedule in place and then deep uncertainty every year as to whether it's going to suddenly ratchet up or be shut down entirely because there's a recession or who knows what. Um, and then there's the whole question of the revenue. And a carbon tax also raises major revenue, uh, just as a cap and trade system can. And in either case, you have to figure out what to do with it. So we would argue that there's a lot more in common than different, um, but that there are some very important advantages to the, the cap, most fundamentally as an environmental organization, the cap, of course, gives you better certainty about the environmental impact of the legislation. By definition, it is a clear declining target in terms of uh, emissions reductions, whereas a, uh, a carbon tax is not that. It's a fixed price per ton and then an unknown amount of emissions reduction coming out of that. Um, and I will tell you that it's hard to imagine a carbon tax coming in that's at the right level uh, to really get the job done. Uh, that, that's my fear. And in fact, we don't really know exactly what the right level is. And then you've got a deeply uncertain process to adjust it. One other interesting nuance that I'll just mention on this topic is that, um, especially in light of the current recession, it's interesting to note that a carbon cap and trade system is naturally and inherently countercyclical for macroeconomic uh, conditions. So if you have a recession, as we've seen in the EU uh, emissions trading system, the price on CO2 allowances will tend to soften. Uh, and that will Im immediately, and even before there's a lot of um, clear evidence of a recession, uh, you will see a, a bit of a, a reduction in that um, pollution price burden on the market. Uh, and the converse happens. If the economy is starting to overheat, you'll see um, a natural countercyclical tendency for the carbon allowance prices to, to pop up. So uh, just one example. Now, could you get the job done with the right carbon tax? Uh, sure. If you put in place a cap and with a clearly adjustable tax schedule, it could work. But um, it's, it's not at all clear that it would be substantially easier. And there are some disadvantages. Oh, and you asked about the EPA. Sorry. I, I, I will not talk at length about that, except to say that we do think that the EPA um, you know, can and will proceed, especially in the absence of legislation. And we want the legislation as quickly as possible because we need a very clear, durable, uh, nationwide system to deal with this problem as effectively and efficiently as possible. Although I'm all for efficiency, I think 
gets some benefit. Well, of course, you get the benefit right there. Uh, you also mentioned that we should move fast in terms of investment. And that's where I get a little bit more concerned about making investments, particularly there's a lot of things that have been tried out in the recent uh, past. You know, We were talking about biofuels just a few hours ago, where we are making big mistakes, in my opinion, in, in some of these investments. And you know, we get excited because the price of oil goes up and all of a sudden we're making uh, mistakes in terms of water, fertilizers, pesticides, land. And we could make that mistake even with solar where you know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, interesting rare air metals that are being used that you know, these things have not been used in such amounts forever. And all of a sudden we're putting them out there. So what are your thoughts? Right, it's a critically important question. So what do we mean when we talk about um, innovation policy broadly for clean supply, investment in clean supply. Well, the non-controversial part of that, or the broadly uncontroversial part of that is basic R&D. And we do support as part of that picture, fully funding or at least better funding energy R&D. Uh, and that's for the standard reasons that you want um, as much, when you want an optimal level of research and development, it's not gonna happen because of innovation spillovers in the lab. And so patents aren't perfect and, and for a lot of reasons you need to more fully fund that kind of research especially, by the way, in the energy sector, which is uniquely slow moving. So the time between development and wide scale uh, application is uh, decades, as opposed to, say, computer chips, right? Where it's a much, much, much faster uh, product cycle. So that part is, in some sense, easy. It's hard to sometimes build the political support to actually get it done, but the concept is not that controversial. The part that you're raising is, well, what about the early stage technology deployment support? And this topic is, uh, is important to me since I wrote my dissertation on it, and I'm probably therefore a little partisan, but, but, I, but I do think that the same logic that applies to uh, the rationale for, for um, supporting research and development upstream applies for early stage deployment in the energy sector specifically, because it is so slow moving, and because, like I tried to illustrate with the carbon capture and storage example, you've got these issues of innovation spillover as you try to cobble together these big systems and get them integrated into the energy system. But you certainly don't want to provide subsidies forever, uh, and so we want to avoid kind of grain ethanol style stories where a technology category, which was already mature, by the way, because we'd been making liquor for some time, uh, <laughs> got locked into endless subsidies, which there's no question have been counterproductive on many levels. Um, I probably shouldn't be saying this so forcefully on, uh, <laughs> on record, but in any event, clearly not helpful. Uh, it's, on my, it's in my dissertation. So, so that's what you don't want to do. Um, and, but by the same token, you want to find a way to make sure that across a whole range of different renewables, for example, there's a way for the industry to get a toehold and to really scale, and you want to take a portfolio approach, in our view, across broad categories of renewables. And then let's talk about solar, for example. So with this scheme um, back here, the notion would be that you know, solar today, I forget, but it's like a tenth of a percent of our power supply or less. I think quite a bit less than that. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny share. But of course, it's been growing at something like 50% a year recently. And it's suddenly not trivial anymore over the next few years. And, and within 10 years, it could be quite a big deal. And within 20 or 30 years, it could be huge. Um, but it's not going to happen without a little bit more uh, support down the learning curve. The, the notion here is that at least there's a couple ways that we would manage against risks here. One is this timeout feature, which I didn't mention in discussing this. But basically, if that category of solar photovoltaics doesn't advance to the next class quickly enough, then you just ratchet to a lower level of support anyway from a timeout function. Um, and then most crucially, unlike the prior legislative vehicle, the subsidies end at some point. Once the whole broad category of photovoltaics, whichever uh, versions of thin films or crystalline or whatever it is, manage to compete and, and, and scale, get to a 5% market share, um, then it's over and, and there's no more endless uh, support. So it's, a, it's an attempt to balance competing, uh, you know, sort of on the one hand fears of micromanagement of technology or, you know, bad technology picking in the details by the government with, I think, the real risk that unless there's some kind of a, a support mechanism, uh, we'll lose the option to develop a whole portfolio of new, of new things ranging from geothermal to uh, wave tidal even, who knows, right? So it's a balancing act, but we think we've got a, an approach that would help. I'd like to go back to one of the slides early in your talk 
where you gave the progression of uh, almost there in the legislation. Mm. Uh, given the number of states that are heavily politically dependent on jobs in the coal industry, and the fact that, uh, yeah, that's the one, and the fact that uh, nuclear is what they call in the planning trade a Lulu, locally undesirable land use, where everyone would like to have the energy, but no one wants to have the waste repository. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you propose with the present breakdown in the Senate, even though you say privately people admit it's a problem that has to be dealt with, uh, and, and you were reluctant to talk in this one area on the camera, how do you expect all those coal state senators to get up uh, and actually uh, put their careers at risk to uh, vote in favor of this thing, which would put tens of thousands of their constituents out of work. <laughs> well, um, I think first off, we we don't need a, we don't need all 100 senators. So uh, that's the brutal math. I mean, we need 60 really, realistically, um, and we'd love to see this go through with. Uh, 100 senators, but it's not likely. Uh, you know, just um, back in uh, 97, you had 95 to zero against Kyoto. You know, so it's um, it's definitely not um, easy terrain. So the point's well taken, and and I think that um, what's needed is a legislative architecture which addresses the regional equity issues um, and. That needs to be done at the industrial level, at the consumer level, um, and it needs to be done in terms of how things like these um, technology deployment and energy efficiency incentives flow. Um, so let me talk about some aspects of that briefly. So for example, um, the support for energy efficiency uh, can, can have a, a major uh, benefit to to all states, um, but in some ways it can be a disproportionate benefit in states that haven't done as much yet on energy efficiency, including the coal dependent states. Um, the carbon capture and storage uh, deployment incentives, which are similar to the renewables deployments for the whole category of carbon capture and storage, uh, US CAP supports a um, sort of declining uh, support mechanism that phases out to zero. That certainly squarely addresses the concerns of the coal dependent states um, and develops uh, hopefully some crucial technologies for dealing with the problem globally uh, yeah, per the discussion about China earlier. Um, all these states can tap into things like the renewables incentives and so on. And a part that's probably worth mentioning is the whole question of the industrial sector. Uh, and that's a very challenging and important part of this. Now, when you put a price on emissions uh, in the US, and China hasn't done so in their context, that's no longer a level international playing field, right? So now you have, at least if it's a trade exposed energy intensive industry like a steel or an aluminum uh, or a cement, the US manufacturer is now playing with one hand tied behind their back because they've got this uh, additional cost factor that the Chinese don't or whatever country doesn't have a, a cap. There are some, frankly, um, worrisome ways to deal with that that might lead to, in, in our view, um, real serious international negotiations complications and WTO issues and so on. Uh, and then we think there's some pretty clever ways to deal with the problem, which would be actually more substantive and really uh, address the carbon leakage risk uh, squarely while helping industry to maintain or even grow production and, and improve their carbon productivity at the same time. Specifically, uh, Representatives Inslee and Doyle introduced um, an amendment to, I guess it was, the, no, it was the Dingle Boucher bill, but anyhow, uh, a, a, which is a very clever approach. Basically what they say is that those industries, uh, like cement, aluminum, and steel, uh, which are trade exposed and energy intensive, would receive their, uh, they would receive some allowances in the following way. Uh, it would be proportionate to the current year's cement output multiplied times for an individual facility, multiplied times the industry average uh, carbon intensity uh, times some factors. And so what that means is that if you beat that industry benchmark by being more uh, carbon productive than your competitor, you profit. It also means that since it's proportional to your output in a given year as a, as a cement maker, if you offshore some of your production, you lose allowances. And if you insure it, you gain allowances. So that's a way to directly address the industrial state's concerns um, in, in some regard. And there's a whole package of things like this that need to come together. 
Um, just along the lines of this last question and some of the comments you just made, I know that uh, since I've worked with you for a while now, you've, you've had an interest in going beyond just the carbon issue and to talk about other public health aspects <clears throat> of, for example, dealing with uh, coal-fired power plants or the transportation sector or, in the cases that you just mentioned, aluminum and cement, which if you take their emissions and apply certain weights to them that reflect toxicity and death and premature such and such, those are the worst polluting industries in the United States. So if somehow you could bring that aspect into this whole mix of discussion, perhaps even the senators in the coal intensive states could say, well, you know, uh, we're going to kill a lot fewer people here if we work on, you know, getting rid of these old coal plants and doing something else. Excellent point. And also, of course, it applies to the international stage where one of the major benefits to China moving ahead, as they are trying to do already with energy efficiency, but as I hope that they will be doing much more aggressively as part of an uh, international uh, climate containment regime, is that they've got something on the order of a half a million people dying every year from pollution from coal-fired power plants. So uh, not to mention direct quality of life problems with all that pollution. And we have a, a, a downsized but still immense public health challenge around our current energy structure here. And that is one of the co-benefits of moving forward on this. Uh, it is important, uh, and maybe even in closing if we're out of time, to highlight that moving forward to a, a world in which we have 50% renewables and beyond, and in which we have a much more efficient economy uh, in terms of our energy consumption, really does give us three critical benefits all at once. It improves our environmental, our economic, and our national security. And all of those are, and, and our public health. So it's, I guess you could call it four, uh, but that's, that goes into the environmental part. Uh, the environmental part is climate change, public health, et cetera. Um, the economic part is that you're, you're then deeply reducing your exposure to volatile uh, fossil fuel prices. It's not just oil, by the way. Coal has been quite volatile recently, uh, and that uh, jockeys, uh, jockeys around the whole economy. Um, and natural gas is uh, notoriously volatile. Uh, and then lastly, um, in, in, in terms of national security, of course, it's helpful to be uh, reducing our overall dependence on, on fossil fuels coming from unstable regions.